Hey, what's up guys, and welcome to Xbox On. Now, over the past few weeks, I've been playing an absolute ton of the new Battlefield 1 DLC. And I've been playing Final Fantasy XV's new DLC. So that's got us thinking about all the awesome DLCs in Xbox's history. So let's take a look. Now, Battlefield 1's They Shall Not Pass DLC has only just come out, but I can safely say that these multiplayer maps are better than the majority of the originals. There's two brand new operations, including Devil's Anvil, which is purely infantry combat. So if that's what floats your boat, you don't have to fight your way through Ballroom Blitz and an army of tanks to make it to the Argonne Forest for that infantry-only fight that you're really looking for. Though, if you do feel like having an all-out tank battle, the Beyond the Marne operation is perfect as you can almost fit your entire team in tanks. Yep, your entire team in tanks. Not only do I feel that the new operations deliver some of the greatest experiences that I've ever had in Battlefield, they've also done an awesome job on some of the new modes they've added, like front lines, which help to constantly force both teams into close proximity of each other for all-out carnage. New weapons have also been added, which you don't have to rely on luck to get your hands on, but instead just completing some in-game challenges, which take no time at all. New maps, new vehicles, new weapons, new game modes that you just wish were in the game at launch, but what more could you ask for from a DLC? Resident Evil 5 somewhat divided opinion, with some loving its tight co-op play and others feeling that it sapped most of the horror from the survival horror genre. Others just couldn't get over the sight of Chris Redfield trying to punch a boulder out of his path. All these are valid opinions. For us, the Lost in Nightmares DLC did a great job of finding the middle ground between different eras of Resident Evil. It fills in some of Five's missing backstory, showing how Chris and Jill came to be facing off in the game. The pair are sent to track down Umbrella's founder in a mansion that is a near replica to the first game's Spencer Mansion. Hey, if you know what you like when it comes to interior decorating, why not stick to it? For the first part of the DLC, it's like being in a remake of Resident Evil 1. You creep around the moonlit house trying to unlock doors by solving obtuse puzzles. You even get to tinkle on a piano to discover a hidden room. When you aren't scratching your head about why someone would choose to live in such a complicated house, you'll be caught up in a nostalgic rush. If you are really familiar with the original game, there are plenty of easter eggs just for you. The DLC does revert to Resident Evil 5's more bombastic action as it goes on. Wesker has basically turned into Agent Smith from the Matrix movies, but for those earlier moments where it's just you and a freaky house, this is well worth investigating. In Call of Duty World at War, a small side project from a few of Treyarch's developers became one of the franchise's biggest successes with Call of Duty Zombies. After the initial inclusion of Zombies as a bonus for completing the World at War campaign, the developer team began to grow, but when Zombies really began to hit its stride was when the DLC started kicking in in Black Ops 2. The first Zombies map in Black Ops 2 was Transit, which by no means set the world alight as it focused on using the bus to get around to different parts parts of the map, where you felt like you could get lost very easily and if your teammates didn't like you, they could just leave you on the bus by yourself which never ended well. However, the four DLC packs over the year brought in four new zombie maps with new easter egg puzzles to solve, thousands of zombies to kill and some amazing maps to explore, including a trip to the Golden Gate Bridge in Mob of the Dead once you had managed to complete the easter egg hidden within Alcatraz. But what I love most about the DLC, which just made it better than the original map, is that each DLC helped to build on the story hidden within zombies by completing the easter eggs and unlocking secret cuts scenes and much much more. Sadly the zombie storyline all came to an end at the end of Black Ops 3 so it'll be interesting to see what Treyarch end up doing next. If you've recently come away from Final Fantasy XV feeling lost and desperate for more, then the upcoming series of DLCs should put a spring back in your step. Each episode will take a closer look at one of Noctis' pals, allowing them to take the centre stage as we delve into their backstories and flesh out their characters a little bit more. If Noctis didn't quite win the place of best boy in your heart, then fear not because Gladio is the first of the three and his story actually fills in a big gap from the main game. If you cast your mind back to chapter 7, Gladio takes off for a bit after an embarrassing defeat. He comes back a bit later all scarred up, but doesn't really divulge what happened to him. Well fear not all you curious cats because the DLC allows you to play through what that sneaky peek Gladio was off doing. Turns out he was taking part in a trial to prove his combat worth and place as Noctis' shield, and he does it with Kor, who once did the trial himself. 
The really cool thing about the DLC is that the combat really takes into consideration that you're playing as Gladio, and thus plays much more like an action game. You'll need to block at a second's notice while also raking in big combos for impressive damage hits. You'll also be able to use Gladio's brute strength to pick up stone pillars and batter enemies with, which is strangely satisfying. As you progress through the trial, you'll be pitted against increasingly hard monsters, ending with a fight against Gilgamesh, a reoccurring presence in the Final Fantasy world. After you take him down, you'll be gifted with a Genji Blade weapon and the Jewel Master Art skill, which you can take with you into the main game, so there's a nice little reward at the end of it all. There's also a time attack mode where you can battle to reach top of the leaderboard. Plus, at the end, we get a sneak peek at the next DLC, which will focus on Prompto. Ah, now there's a best boy if I've ever seen one. Dark Souls 3 has just been given a second slice of DLC to help smash expert players into a bloody paste, but for our list we're actually going with the original Dark Souls Artorias of the Abyss. The first piece of Dark Souls DLC set the tone for all the series DLC. It gives players a chance to dig deeper into the game's complex lore and gives the designers the chance to unleash some of their toughest creations yet. Artorias of the Abyss ticks the lore box by whisking players hundreds of years into the past to help rescue a character from a twisted beast. For those deep into the story, it helps pad out some of the history of the world, whilst also introducing you to some fun new faces, including the brilliantly named Marvelous Chester. <laughs> But the real hook are the DLC's incredible bosses, some of the toughest and most satisfying fights in the entire series. You get to fight a brave knight who attempted to complete your same mission before being corrupted by his quest. He hits hard and fast, but there's huge satisfaction in learning to read his moves and start dueling with him properly. Manage to survive this brutal encounter and you get to fight a freaking dragon. Good luck with that by the way, and whatever the hell this thing is meant to be, I have no idea. If you get through all this lot, you have proven yourself to be a true Dark Souls master. Now it's time to try it all again on the even harder new game plus. As the game says, prepare to die. If you enjoyed your brief trip to Rapture, the underwater dystopia from Bioshock 1 and 2, in the final moments of Bioshock Infinite you should take a look at Burial at Sea. This expansion takes place in Rapture before everything went to hell, and reimagines Infinite's heroes as the private eye and femme fatale at the heart of a detective story. At first it feels like a strange spin-off, but as the story unfolds across two episodes you begin to see how it carefully ties all the Bioshock games together. You'll have to play it to find out how. For those who want to go along for the ride, this is a hugely fun tale in its own right. Getting to explore Rapture during its glory days is a treat, with loads of fun nods and references for fans of the series. It also really captures the mood and atmosphere of the film noirs with some cute twists, such as flame plasmids used instead of lighters. A great touch. As an actual game, things get a lot more interesting in the second chunk of the story, where it shifts into a stealth-like experience. Trying to sneak Elizabeth around guard patrols, creeping along soft carpets in order to knock out enemies, and using sleep darts to take down larger groups gives Burial at Sea a really different rhythm to the guns and magic of the main game. Of course, those options are still there, but it's much more fun to try and master a new style. You'll probably need a notebook and pen, not to mention a degree in quantum physics, to fully understand how everything connects. But isn't it about time we gave our brains a workout? If you're a fan of Ken Levine's wonderful world, you'll have to revisit Rapture. Rockstar have always delivered on great DLC, with both The Lost and the Damned and The Ballad of Gay Tony adding loads of great content to Grand Theft Auto 4. Gay Tony very nearly made our list as it rediscovers a sense of silly fun that is slightly absent from Nico Bellic's Tale of Revenge, but at the end of the day nothing can quite compare to the magic of Red Dead Redemption's Undead Nightmare. The idea of turning a Wild West simulator into a zombie action game may sound dumb on paper, but the game is so much fun to play. The dead have risen from the grave, giving John Marston a reason to tour all those familiar locations from the main game and clearing them out of zombie hordes. It's great to meet all the characters you've grown attached to and seeing how they are holding up against the undead. The answer for most of them, not well. There's an absolute ton of stuff for you to do, from clearing out settlements, to meeting freaky strangers in the wilderness, to finding loads of new side quests. You also get to hunt and catch the Four Horses of the Apocalypse, amazingly powerful steeds that grant extra bonuses once you manage to tame them. It's not as long as the main game, but it moves at a great pace and is never boring. 
But the real highlight has to be shooting the zombies. Red Dead's combat was pretty great to begin with, but adding the ability to make heads explode and it raises to another level. I particularly like the blunderbuss weapon you unlock for helping Nigel West Dickens. One shot from this bad boy turns any enemy into a cloud of gore. Needless to say, if we don't get a zombie outbreak in Red Dead Redemption 2, we will be very, very sad indeed. We were torn about which DLC to include for The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. The wizards at CD Projekt Red have cooked up two incredible slices of DLC, both of which are must-play games. Hearts of Stone tells the story of Geralt's battle with a mysterious stranger who tricks him into a series of seemingly impossible goals. It's an amazing tale with some of the game's best writing, worth playing just for the scenes where Geralt becomes possessed by a randy ghost. But as good as it is, we're actually picking blood and wine for our list. This second expansion took Geralt to a whole new region, the gorgeous summer land of Toussaint. If the main game is set in the grim reality of medieval times, then Toussaint owes more of a debt to fairy tales. It's a world of romance and Disney-esque castles. Obviously, Geralt sticks out like a sore thumb. There's a huge amount of fun to be had watching our grumpy witcher negotiate the royal court and its legions of prissy knights. Yes, yes, there's the more pressing matter of someone or something eating the local population, but that's merely one small part of this huge new kingdom. There are giant monsters to slay, new Gwent decks to build, and acres of countryside to purge of bandits. Personally, we were much more interested in taking possession of our own vineyard and slowly doing the place up. Yes, it'll take some scrubbing to get all that blood out of the courtyard, and there's a small matter of the vampire in the basement, but whatever it takes to get your foot on the property ladder, right? More than anything, it's just a huge pleasure to be exploring such a bright and colourful land after hundreds of hours of mud and rain. Okay, so Toussaint is deeply rotten under that beautiful skin, but that doesn't prevent our hero from enjoying a much-deserved holiday. So there we have it, let us know what your favourites are in the comments below and if you're new to the channel hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future videos. And don't forget to smash that like button if you enjoyed this video and to check out last week's list show whilst you're at it. We'll see you next time. Bye! Bye.